We'd like to welcome our very special guest today, Reverend Dr. Jerry Troyer. As I mentioned earlier, he is coming from San Diego, and he is here to visit with us here at City of Life. He is the president of the Affiliated New Thought Network, a powerful network of New Thought congregations, congregations that are embracing a metaphysical, meaning beyond the spiritual journey and ministry. And he is uh, a powerful motivational speaker. As I mentioned earlier, he did an amazing workshop on the power of forgiveness. The forgiveness is a process, not simply an event. And we are so thrilled that he's been a pastor and brings to us a great wealth of spiritual insight. So today I invite you to open up your hearts to receive the wonderful word coming to us from Reverend Dr. Jerry Troyer. Would you give him a round of applause as we welcome him? God bless you, Jerry. Good to have you with us. Back to you. Good morning, dear ones. Good morning. Good morning. I am so honored and thrilled to be with you this morning. I have a purpose for this. Stay tuned, I promise. First of all, I bring you love and greetings from the affiliated New Thought Network. As Dr. Paul was speaking, we are a membership organization of about 25 New Thought Religious Science, Unity, and Divine Science churches and centers, as well as about 75 ministers, practitioners, and other individuals all on this path of newness and discovery and possibility. As Dr. Paul mentioned, I am the president of the board. It is my honor to serve our members and friends. Also with us this morning is your beloved Dr. John Karn, who is our administrator. So you have the most high of the most high with you this morning. <laughs> Thank you so much. It brings me great joy to get to get on a plane to start, to go anywhere. And I don't know about you, but it's been a long 16 months or so that we've not really been able to do so much. So it feels so good to be back together as a family to go and do and see. And so um, it was really embarrassing because I really wanted to kiss the side of the airplane uh, when I got on in San Diego on Thursday. I did not, but I just so wanted to. But it is just so wonderful to be out and about and to be especially in Atlanta. Whenever I come to see you, I feel a little like I'm coming home. Uh, I have a long-standing, wonderful relationship, I feel like, with with City of Light and with Dr. Paul because we, we met in about 2012 when I was writing my first book. There's a, there's a second one out in the ethers that's going to happen, but writing my first book and I reached out to Reverend Elder Nancy Wilson, who was the moderator for the Universal Fellowship of Metropolitan Community Churches. And of course, at that time, you were first MCC. If you've ever had the experience of, do, of just really wanting to do something or create something or have something, and we rely on this oneness that Alan talked about, this oneness and this still small voice, and we ask, what do I need to do and what's next? And the still small voice says, well, call this person or email this person. And that was my experience with the book. And so I got the thought, you need some blurbs. And, and you know, on the, on the front cover and on the back cover of a book, there are those two or three sentence statements about how wonderful the book is. Those, are, those really are called blurbs. And so the still small voice said, reach out to Nancy Wilson. She's the moderator of UFMCC. There's no way in the world. And the still small voice said, Yes, but do this. And if you've ever had that experience, you know, the still small voice gets a little less still and a less small, a little less small sometimes. You really need to do this. So I did. And she responded and wrote a blurb about the book. So I reached out to some MCC pastors, and one of those was our beloved Dr. Paul. So 
met many of you when if you've been around for for that amount of time met many of you back in 2013 or 14 and we've been on this kind of remote amazing experience with with dr paul's life and my life mirroring in many amazing and wonderful ways um my i work in san diego with urban street angels which is an organization that provides housing and employment to homeless 18 to 25 year olds and i so honor you for the amazing work that you do with crossroads in providing food and clothing and all the rest of those things and of course you know what you're really providing is unconditional love that so many of these people people may have not experienced in a really long time or ever so i so honor you for your work there and then and i'll talk about this later my husband made his transition about two and a half years ago and of course we know that that our beloved robert did a few months ago as well and so these these heart breaking yet heart opening and heart warming experiences through this thing called called life so to make a long story even longer it is my great pleasure to be with you and i'm so glad you're with me this morning Oh, and I forgot to mention that I got to ride in the red Mercedes, the red Mercedes convertible in the Pride Parade in about 2014 in Atlanta. How cool was that? That was just, oh my God, so cool. So my thanks, my great thanks to, uh, to Dr. Paul, to Dr. John, to your board and the rest of you for the opportunity to be with you today. My topic for today is honoring and celebrating diversity and keep your fork. I'll explain that later. Keep your fork. This is Pride Month, as you know, and we're, as we do every month and every day of every year, we're celebrating diversity. And when we think about diversity so often, it has to do with of our communities and of our experience of, and of our physical life and all of that. And I would suggest for us that there's the opportunity to expand that to honor diversity in our experiences. So can we open our hearts and take it all in rather than just those things that we said we really wanted? In this teaching we call religious science or new thought, we focus on the positive which is as it should be. You know, Jesus in the New Testament, Jesus said, it's done unto you as you believe. He said, greater than these things will you do. His teaching was one of oneness and of possibility and of relationship with our God, spirit, the universe, the infinite, the divine, our higher power, whatever we choose to call it. Call it. But very positive, but very positive and very affirming. Our teaching tells us that everything is in divine order, that everything is as it should be, that it's all good. And the truth is, everything is in divine order. Everything is as it should be. That's the truth. But the fact is, we may be experiencing something very different. In this thing called life, we go through death and loss and grief and anger and all of those bad emotions. What do we do with those? How do we experience what we experience? And do we allow ourselves to be spiritual beings having a human experience and feel those feelings. So we're talking about something that we don't talk about very often, and I just love to stir the pot. I, lo I love to talk about something we don't talk about very often, so I'm so glad you're with me. Sometimes when we have a situation, and I have personal experience that I'll share with you in a minute about this, but we go through a death, we go through a loss, we go through a change in a relationship 
And I don't, I don't like the word the end of a relationship because it doesn't really end because where is the relationship? It's in our minds and in our hearts. So it doesn't end, it just changes. But we go through that experience of divorce or death or, or a job ends or we have something in our lives that we would have chosen be different. What do we do? How do we respond? Do we take our spiritual magic wand and just say, well, everything is as it should be. Well, everything is in divine order. Well, I'm just gonna move on. We talk, as Dr. Paul mentioned, we talked about forgiveness yesterday and, and I, I brought the magic wand for that as well because you know so often we talk about forgiveness and something that we judge as horrendous happened and we just wave the magic wand and forgive it. Maybe before we're ready. Maybe before we're ready to actually forgive it because we haven't felt the feelings yet. Can we allow ourselves to do that? There is a Zen saying, may we exist like a lotus at home in muddy water, Thus we bow to life as it is. Can we bow to life as it is? Yes, this happened. Yes, I experienced this. Yes, can I wholeheartedly experience whatever it was? Not staying stuck, and I'm not suggesting that we stay stuck in our stuff, to use a purely spiritual term, but can we, can we acknowledge it and experience it, but also keep moving? I shared the expression yesterday that you probably have heard before, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't need to stop and build a condo. So we do that, we do, but, but we do that and we have that experience, but then we allow ourselves to keep moving and to keep healing and to keep reminding ourselves of the truth of who we are. Because life is joy and wonder and passion and these most amazing experiences. And life is joy, is loss and grief and heartbreak and all of those other things. But it's all this thing called life. Debbie Ford, a wonderful author, you might have written, some, might have heard of her or read some of her books, and um, she was a dear friend. And she wrote, "What we can't be with, won't let us be. Can we be with that anger? Can we be with that hurt and with that memory and that experience, so that we can move forward?" We remember just the goofiest things. I have a dear friend in Knoxville who is a co-Golden Girls fan. And whenever we get together, if there's even the possibility of, remi of reminding one another of a line from a Golden Girls episode, one of us is gonna mention it and we're gonna laugh about it. It's just, you know, the, the, the space in our brains that we've given to Golden Girls uh, um, lines, you know, we could, cure cancer, solve world hunger, and do a few other things if we weren't using that brain space for that. But we all have the most amazing memories. I bet you could sing the Pina Colada song with me. And if you're not old enough to remember the Pina Colada song, I don't want to hear about it. But for the rest of us, I bet we could sing that. It's a great song, and we probably heard it over and over again in the 80s. So we remember we remember what happened last week and last month and last year and maybe 20 or 30 years ago. And we might remember the hurt and the anger and the disappointment and all of those emotions that came along with that experience. Is there a way for us to feel those feelings and process it through? Yes, there is. But 
we sometimes want to stay away from that. We want to have this, this window dressing and this image of all is well. And again, the truth is all is well, but the fact is we may be hurting. Brenny Brown, a wonderful author in the book, uh, The Gifts of Imperfection, she says, owning our story and loving ourselves through that process is the bravest thing that we will ever do. And she writes about perfectionism. And, and you know, I'm not leaving the house until my, my hair is done and I'm dressed up and everything is wonderful and I'm wonderful and life is wonderful and everything is wonderful while I'm still hurting from whatever it is. And in the book she writes, perfectionism is not the same thing as striving to be your best. Perfectionism is not about healthy achievement and growth. Perfectionism is the belief that if we live perfect, look perfect, and act perfect, we can minimize or avoid the pain of blame, judgment, and shame. But it's just a shield. Perfectionism is a 20-ton shield that we lug around thinking it will protect us when in fact it's the thing that's really preventing us from taking flight. Can we say, yeah, that really hurts. Can we say, I'm angry about that. Can we allow ourselves to have this wholehearted life experience? It's been the most, and we were talking about this before, this is the most amazing, it's been the most amazing 16 months or so, and many of us have missed memorial services. My mother died from COVID in January, and of course, we didn't have a memorial service because you couldn't. And I wasn't with her in the hospital when she died because I couldn't. Many of us have missed weddings and graduations and just getting together with, with one another and so forth. And so as we begin to come back together, there's the opportunity to rejoice that we're getting back to normal again, but also to feel that that 16 months or so that, that we missed out on. And that's okay, it's absolutely okay. So my story is that my husband, who was also Jerry, so if you hear me talk about Jerry, it's, uh, there's, there really are two of us, I promise, or were. He died, passed away, made his transition, whatever words you use for that, in the airport in Houston on the way home from the Anton Conference um, in 2018. He had had uh, colorectal cancer and the Chemo was doing wonderful things for the tumors, but terrible things to his physical body. And so he died in the airport on the way home from the conference. And so if you've ever had that experience of losing a dear one, no matter where it happened or what, and whether it was sudden or, or expected, it is a heart-wrenching, heart-breaking, heart-opening experience. And so I did what I needed to do in Houston, flew home the next morning, called and made the arrangements for, for cremation in Texas and then his body to be the remains to be shipped later and went through all of that, collected his luggage, got home, went home to the house, the empty house with my luggage and his luggage and sat down and started to grieve. And my ego, and you might remember uh, Wayne Dyer says that ego stands for edging God out. My ego said, ah, you are a religious science minister. You are a religious science practitioner. You shouldn't be doing this. He's in a better place. Everything is as it should be. It's all good. It's in divine order. And I really had this conflict of wanting to feel what I was feeling, 
but at the same time feeling like I shouldn't. That's one of my favorite words. Don't you love the word should? Just, I feel like if we could take a word in the dictionary and take it out and send it into space, <laughs> the word should, because it's probably something we don't want to do when we're thinking I should. I should go to the gym this afternoon. I shouldn't have that second piece of chocolate cake. Of course, the, the, um, the one thing that you should do is go to church. But so that's the exception, not the rule, just, just so you know. But I shouldn't be having these feelings. And eventually the still small voice, and we talked about this before, getting a word in edgewise said, yes, you should. It's okay. And not only is it okay, but it's necessary. We allow, so we allow ourselves to experience all of it, all the joy, all the wonder. We were together for 33 years. It was amazing and wonderful, and I get to grieve this. You get to grieve this, whatever this is. We celebrate Father's Day today, and we honor the amazing fathers that are out there, and mine was amazing. Mine, mine loved me more than I loved myself, and he just was incredible. And so I celebrate with you if that was your experience with your father, and if it wasn't, I hold you in my heart because there's the opportunity to, rather than feeling like it should have been, or feeling guilty because it didn't look like a Hallmark card, we can, we can forgive, we can feel it, we can forgive it when we're ready, and down the road, not using it as an excuse, but down the road, recognize that they did the best they could. Because we're always doing the best we can so is everybody else, which is a whole nother Sunday morning talk, so I won't go down that road. But feel that whatever you're feeling today on Father's Day, whether it's celebration or not, allow yourself to feel that. So often we label our emotions as good and bad. We have the bucket of good emotions love and peace and joy and harmony and rainbows and teddy bears and all of those other things. And then as human beings, have, as spiritual beings having a human experience, we have the bad bucket of grief and hurt and anger and all of those others. What if we could drill a hole in the side of the good bucket and drill a hole in the side of the bad bucket and run a pipe between the buckets, and then our human emotions are just emotions. We feel it so we can heal it. And until we do, we can't. So take off the labels and just recognize, wow, this is what I'm feeling now, and not only is it okay, but it's also necessary. If we don't, we can create some grief about our grief and some anger about our anger and some hurt about our hurt. And we can be here the rest of the day with examples of that, but you get the point. If, if we, when we allow ourselves to feel it, then we can begin to heal it. Do you have, and you don't have to respond, you can tell me later, do you have a junk drawer or a junk closet or a junk room or a junk storage facility where all those things that you don't want to look at today kind of reside? And we put the stuff, I got to get to that, and it, if it creeps its way up to the top of the drawer or the front of the drawer, we just push it back down again. But it stays there. 
you have, and those of you that are old enough might remember Fibber McGee's Closet was a radio show in the 40s and 50s, which was before my time, I am proud to say, um, uh, where, it, and you, if you remember the show, they, you, you'd hear, because it was radio, so you couldn't see, but you'd hear, they'd open the closet door and you'd hear this crash, because they'd open the closet door and the closet was full of stuff again, using the purely metaphysical term. What's in our junk drawer? Our junk drawer can be that anger and that hurt and that grief and that loss from earlier this morning or last week or 50 years ago that we've just not been able to deal with. So how do we know? Because something happens. You see a television show that reminds you of someone or you hear a song that reminds you of an experience or somebody says something and all of a sudden you are just so angry or all of a sudden you're at Costco and whoever it is in the front of the line is looking for their membership card that they knew they needed before they got out of the car but they're parked crossways and you're running late and your blood pressure starts to go up. Or there's somebody on 285 and you're just trying to get to Kroger's but there's somebody on 285 doing 50 miles an hour in the left lane talking on the phone and here comes this anger. What we can't be with won't let us be. But we can look at this. We can allow this. We can process this. And we can heal these feelings, not good or bad, just these feelings, recognizing that it's all part of this lusciousness of life. Where did that pint of Ben and Jerry's go? What happened to that bag of Cheetos? I really was only going to eat one piece of the pizza. I don't know about you, but that was my, as, as I was going through this experience with my husband, those were my antidepressants, and that's okay. But when we're ready, we can look at our motivations behind whatever that is and decide what we need to feel so we can heal. Unexpressed feelings and emotions can show up as physical illness, as you know, as well as unmanifest, not unanswered, but unmanifest prayers. Do you have something in your life? You're just, you know, we do our affirmative prayer, our spiritual mind treatment, and I just know and I accept, and so it is and tomorrow and next week and next month, I'm still working on this. And, and why isn't this, why isn't this happening for me? Why am I not, why am I not seeing the wonderful new relationship or the wonderful new job or the greater financial abundance or the greater physical health? Because we know we're not ever talking God into doing something, we can ask, what must I change about myself in order to receive this? What do I believe about this that I say I want? Do I believe that I deserve it? And do I have residue, for lack of a better word, from the past relationship or the past job or my belief about money or just whatever it is that I can heal and release? We can always, see the, the great thing is we can always ask, what's going on here? What do I need to change so I can experience this greater life? We can always ask that and the still small voice tells us what we need to know. It Very often it requires forgiveness. One of the things I talk about whenever I do a memorial service is the need for forgiveness because very often we need to forgive whoever it was that died. I know that might sound kind of funny, but 
That's been my experience. Maybe from the way you look at it, they didn't take care of themselves. Or maybe they did and you're just angry with them for going before you did. And that's okay. We can feel that so we can heal it. Those of us who have had this experience when of the loss of a relationship, nope, not a, didn't lose a relationship, a change in a relationship, or a change in a job, a job that you love. If you've ever had a job that you love that went away, you might have the thought that it's never going to be good again. I'm, it's, it's, I'm never gonna find a relationship like that again. The truth is, you won't. But you will find, if you're open to it, and if you allow it, you will find a wonderful and amazing new relationship full of new possibilities and a new job as long as we believe it's possible and we know that it's possible because our beloved Dave here uh, is with Dr. Paul and I know from personal experience because I have an absolutely wonderful and adorable new young man in my life <laughs> it is possible when we allow it because life always says yes yes so we heal the old we feel the old we experience the old so we can pre be prepared to step into the new and through this process we keep our fork we had a wonderful dinner at uh, dr paul and dave's house last night with the uh, City of Light board. And after dinner, Dave came by to collect the plates. And he said, keep your fork. And I was reminded of a story of a, an older lady. See, I got to watch the, how I use the word older. But, <laughs> <laughs> but an older lady who was meeting with her pastor and planning for her final service. And she said, I want to be buried with a fork. And he gave her a minute and said, why in the world would you want to do that? And she said, well, whenever I go to a nice dinner and maybe it wasn't exactly what, I'm, what I had in mind and, and I'm, I'm ad-libbing to this, but there might have been cooked turnip. Ever had cooked turnip? Ugh. Or boiled Brussels sprouts? Ugh. Or something that you just didn't necessarily have in mind, but you have to clean your plate and then keep your fork in anticipation of the most amazing new life experience. Still got some stuff to this, as you can tell. So we allow ourselves, because that's all we're ever doing. We allow ourselves to experience this thing called life with all of its joys and wonders and all of its Brussels sprouts and cooked turnips. And we keep our fork knowing that this came to pass. You remember in the Bible, so many of the stories started out with it and it came to pass. So this came to pass so that we can move into that next most amazing great experience when we allow it, when we accept it. So we keep our fork for the wonderful experiences of what's next. Holding on to these emotions, and I'll close with this, not picking on anybody, but we're in Atlanta, keep holding on to these emotions are like flying on Delta in the back of the coach cabin in the middle seat. Can't, can't really take a deep breath, can't exhale, might be next to a fleshy flyer, and there's just not enough room. When we allow ourselves to feel what we feel, when we allow ourselves to experience the lusciousness of all of this, knowing that we never walk alone in whatever it was, it's an automatic upgrade to 
first class. That's what we're here for. For our 50 or 60 or 90 or 110 years or however long we're here for, as the essence, expression, and experience of God, that's what we're here for. So we can keep our fork. Would you join me in prayer for just a minute? So in the peace and the quiet of this moment, we allow ourselves to be reminded of our oneness with this loving, nurturing presence that we call God. Spirit, the universe, the infinite, the divine, our higher power, whatever we choose to call it. And we give great thanks for and bless this beloved spiritual community at City of Light. We bless this amazing program offering unconditional love to people who need it that we call Crossroads. And moving forward, we allow ourselves to say yes, to say yes to that grief so we can heal it, to say yes to those feelings regardless of what we labeled them so that we can move forward and move from coach to first class, because that's what we're here for. We give great thanks for this teaching, for our time together, for moving back into community. For our time together in all of this, we say thank you. And together we say, and so it is. Namaste, namaste, namaste. Thanks everybody.